morning to all of you. So today we will start our section on ecology. Now you see, it would be a short, very short session of six classes, and we will be able to complete everything. Don't worry about it. At least I will be able to complete everything. Now let us come to this word ecology. Now this word was coined by a German biologist. His name Ernst Haeckel. He coined this term ecology. And before that, ecology was uh, mostly studied under life sciences, especially say biology or botany. Under under such sciences, you would have a tinge of ecology. But ecology as a science never gained so much of prominence before the contributions made by Arthur Tansley, who coined the word ecosystem. But anyhow, we'll come to them later. Ernst Haeckel, a German biologist. He coined the term ecology. In fact, he did not coin the term ecology. All books would say that he coined the term ecology, but he did not coin the term ecology. He coined the term ecology, because he was a German. Obviously, he might have termed coined a German term. But ecology is an English adaptation of that word. Now, ecology. If you see, if you break that word, you can break them into two words: oikos and logos. Both Greek <coughs> words. Now, oikos means home, and logos means study of. So, ecology literally means the study of the environment as the home for the organisms. That is ecology. So, write one line. Ecology literally means the study of the environment. The study of the environment. As the home for the organisms, the home for organisms. Clear? Now you see one thing that, uh, as far as uh, environment is concerned, it has been the crux of all studies in geography. Geography, in fact, very simply put, is nothing but man-environment relationships, either with the natural environment or with the physical environment or your cultural environment. It means the man-made environment. But look at this one point: that when we say environment, it includes both natural landscape as well as cultural landscape. But when we say environment in ecology, we are limiting ourselves only to the natural or physical environment. Clear? So you right. Ecology is concerned only with physical environment or the natural landscape. Physical environment or the natural landscape. It is the study of. It is the study of. Man environment relationships. <coughs> Man environment relationships. But is it only the study of man environment relationship? No, these statements or these definitions are not very much sound when you try to understand the subject. Rather, this would be a more scientific definition. Let us see this. Now think of a simple ecosystem. Now, in that ecosystem, consider there are these organisms. There are grasses, and say there are deers, and there are lions. Now, can I say the grasses they interact with the soil? Do they interact with the sunlight? Do they interact with water? Yes. Do they interact with carbon dioxide? Do they release? Oxygen, etc. Yes. What about deer? Do deer also interact with, say, surface, sunlight, water, oxygen, carbon dioxide? What about lion? Almost the same. But the deer feeds on the grasses, and similarly the lion feeds on the deer. And so there is a relationship between them as well. Also, deer, it interacts with other deer, and the interaction can be, say, for example, reproduction or competition. Similarly, the lion interacts with other lions, maybe competition, for example, 
So what is ecology? If you see, we have already defined ecology. Ecology is a science of interrelationships. Bas ye baat dhyan mein rakhna and you will understand ecology. Interrelationships of what kind? Interrelationships among organisms. It means between one lion and another lion. Between organisms, like between a lion and a deer. And between them and all aspects of their environment, be it biotic or abiotic. That is ecology. That would be a scientific definition, also working definition of ecology. So ecology, I'm saying, is the study of interrelationships that exist among organisms, between organisms, and between them and all aspects of their environment, be it biotic or abiotic. Okay, when I say biotic and when I say I compare it with abiotic, biotic and abiotic, how do you distinguish them? Do you distinguish them as organic versus inorganic? No, not always. Why? Because abiotic components, give me some examples of abiotic, air, water, soil, sunlight, this would be all abiotic, whereas biotic would be producers, consumers, stock consumers, etc. Clear? But think of something like humus. Humus is mostly what? Organic in origin, but it is abiotic. The word biota in life sciences means life. It must have some sort of life. It does not translate to having some sort of organic origin or organic structure. So biotic includes only those things that have life. Whereas abiotic includes inorganic as well as dead organic. Clear? So you write one line. Ecology is a science of interrelationships. Ecology is a science of interrelationships. Bas baki definition to likha hua hai pas. So just write one more line. Humus is abiotic. Humus is abiotic. Put semicolon and write. Abiotic includes inorganic as well as dead organic. Abiotic includes inorganic as well as dead organic. Clear? So you see, this is Ernst Haeckel, the German biologist, and he says ecology is the scientific study of the relationship and interactions among organisms, between organisms, and between them and all aspects of their environment. Can you understand this now? The term ecology is derived from two Greek words, oikos meaning home and logos meaning the study of. So we understand the definition of ecology. Let us move then further. Look at this, the levels of organization in life sciences. Though this is not only life sciences, but includes all sciences in this organization. Now, life sciences, you know, the unit of study in life sciences is gene. Clear? From the gene, you have cells. From cells, you have tissues. From tissues, you have organ. From organ, organism. Organism to population. Different populations make one community. Different communities, when they are superimposed over a physical landscape, make an ecosystem. Several ecosystem coalesces and they form landscape. Several landscape give you a <coughs> biome and several biomes give you one biosphere. And biosphere, you understand, is part of Earth, which is part of solar system, which is part of galaxy, which is part of universe. So this is not definitely Earth sciences, or sorry, life sciences, but they come under Earth sciences or say astronomy. But this is more what is the subject matter of ecology. It starts from organisms and goes up to biosphere. So organism is the unit of study in ecology and biosphere is the largest unit of study in ecology. So write one line. Organism is the unit of study in ecology. <coughs> organism is the unit of study in ecology while biosphere is the largest unit of study while biosphere is the largest unit of study. <coughs> now look at this. Say for example organs. Different organs also interact with each other. Now think about the entire di digestive system. Do you have some interactions between say the esophagus and the intestine and the stomach? These are all organs. And we said that ecology is a science of 
interrelationships and interactions. So there is interactions going on. But ecology is not bothered about interaction that goes on inside the body of an organism. That is the subject matter of biology. So you write one line that ecology is not bothered with the interactions. Ecology is not bothered with the interactions that occur within the within the body of an organism within the body of an organism for example during the digestive system respiratory system etc so yes it deals with interactions but interactions with other individuals or with the environment are you clear with that? Now, individuals might become, may belong to the same species or they might belong to different species. Now, look at this. Organism and how do you define organism? See, organism is anything that has three things. And what are they? They are physiology, morphology and behavior. Now, for example, if suppose I have a tennis ball and I throw it against a wall. Will it bounce back? Yes. yes. That's a kind of behavior shown by the ball. The ball also has a morphology. Morphology means shape. shape. But it, it does not qualify as an organism. Why? Because it does not have physiological processes. What are physiological processes? They are the biochemical processes that goes on within your body. Are you clear with that? Only when, if suppose the tennis ball has eyes and ears and it could walk or it could breathe at least. I would say that would qualify as an organism. Do you understand this? So an organism is something which has physiology, morphology and behavior. Did you get that? Okay. So you write one line. Organism is anything that has, organism is anything that has morphology. Morphology means shape, morphology, physiology. Physiology means biochemical processes, physiology and behavior. And if you see one thing, several times organisms make changes to them in order to survive. Changes with respect to morphology, behavior or physiology. Like say for example, think of hibernation. What kind of a change is it? Physiological change. It means you try to alter your metabolic activities. Similarly, think of, have you heard about uh, the porcupine and have you seen that it has, have you, s yes, now that's a what kind of change, it's a morphological change. Similarly, the snake you would see that in times when it is under distress, either due to uh, a competitor or when it sees a threat, it enlarges itself and that's a morphological change. And when you make changes to your physiology, morphology or behavior, behavior say for example some organisms have adapted to nocturnal conditions, they hunt during the night, this is nothing but adaptation, isn't it? Yes. So you're right. Adaptation is the change or adjustment, is the change or adjustment in physiology morphology or behavior, physiology, morphology or behavior. <clears throat> and why do organisms adapt? Why do they adapt? Survival, should I? The aim of adaptation is survival. The aim of adaptation is survival. At least that is what has been told to us by Charles Darwin. That the ultimate aim of evolution is survival. If you do not evolve, you get out of the ecosystem. So anyhow, so do you understand what is an organism? Now let us come to understand this, that what is, what are populations? Now populations are nothing, but they are a group of organisms belonging to the same species. Now when we say belonging to the same species, we mean that these organisms, they can interbreed 
and produce fertile offsprings. Do you understand this? Like say for example, you cannot say that the snake and the hen belong to the same species because they cannot interbreed. Do you understand this? But that is the reproduction test and the reproduction test is possible only when you have two genders at least. When you do not, when you have the same gender and suppose you have never seen the organisms and you see that whether they belong to the same species or not, the only way to test is at a particular stage in their lives, do they undergo the same physiological or morphological changes? And if this is true, then we say that both of them belong to the same category. It means they are all of the same species. Now think of this. Say for example, think of boys. When they achieve puberty, they grow this facial hair and the Adam's apple goes out. And you can understand the boys grow heavy and all those kind of things. So we say that at the same stage, maybe at 13, 14, some even earlier than that, they undergo some physiological changes. These are hormonal changes. Okay. Now, look at this. So I'm saying that populations are those group of individuals where all the individuals belong to the same species. That's why we say tiger population, elephant population or human population. Human population was a cause of concern for us in geography. We have already seen that. We'll talk about other populations apart from human population. Now see one more thing that the same species may have several racial manifestations. What do I mean by that? Say for example, man in Africa is black, man in Eurasia or say Western Europe is white, man in Latin America is red, man in subcontinent is brown and man in East Asia is yellow. Now these are all racial segregations. Race is a good thing <laughs> again say when you study it in biology. But it becomes a bad thing when you study it in sociology. <laughs> it means, as an ki chhod dena topic. What I mean is, when you bring it into social discussions and you discriminate on the basis of race. But Article 15 says that the state shall not discriminate on the grounds of religion, race. Achha, ye ruk jao bhi. <laughs> Do you understand this? So you see this that, but even though they have racial differences, like say for example. If a black man marries uh, from, one from the Latin America, they would still, they may uh, bear a child. Do you understand this? So it means they are, they can interbreed. So what do we understand by this? We understand that, that the species may have racial manifestations. Races are not a hindrance in reproduction. Whereas species, two organisms, say for example the snake and the hen, they cannot reproduce because they belong to different species. And why can't they reproduce? Either because of their biological makeup or morphological hindrances or both. Clear? See you right. <coughs> populations are group of individuals. Populations are group of individuals belonging to the same species, belonging to the same species, put a semicolon and write, <coughs> organisms belonging to the same species, organisms belonging to the same species can interbreed, can interbreed and produce fertile offspring and produce fertile offspring. A, a single species may have several, a single species may have several racial manifestations, several racial manifestations And race, you know, relates to ethnicity. Yes. So put a semicolon and write. Racial diversification is no hindrance. <coughs> Racial di diversification is no hindrance in breeding. No hindrance in breeding. 
and you know that if the organisms they belong to the same gender the test is the physiological test clear whether they undergo the same changes at more or less the same time in their lives sure right <coughs> if two individuals belong to the same gender if two individuals belong to the same gender it is the physiological test it is the physiological test which helps in deciding whether they are of the same species whether they are of the same species or not but you see that scientists they were very uh, amazed when they saw that if they keep a lion and a tigress or a tiger and a lioness in some say isolation they may breed and have you heard about something like the liger which is lion plus tiger do they belong to the different species but at times even if you belong to different species you may still interbreed if you belong to the same family like the cat family in this case clear so keep this also in mind now look at this communities communities means that it's a group of populations belonging to different species like say for example in this example of our ecosystem where i said that there were grasses deer and lion the biological community or the biotic community or bio community is very simple it is lion deer and grasses three organisms are you clear with that so i'm saying that community can i define it like this it's a group of organisms belonging to different species yes now you see when we say ki he belongs to or she belongs to my community that is again when we are talking with respect to our cultural environment and our social interactions but in life sciences when you say community you include organisms all the biota that is present in an ecosystem clear so you right communities refer to group of populations communities refer to group of populations or organisms belonging to different species organisms belonging to different species can i say greater the number of organisms of different kind in a biological community larger is the biodiversity yeah. and greater is the biodiversity greater are the chances of survival of that community though it may undergo some changes maybe some new organisms may get added or some old organisms may get deleted yet the community survives do you understand this it means what do i mean that if you have more diversity you have more chances of survival like say for example someone who is very good in all the subjects but has not read science or history then that aspirant is not very diverse it means the knowledge is not complex but very simple ho sakta hai ek hi subject padha hai pure saal bhar aur bahut acche se aata hai wo yet the chances of clearing the preliminary examinations are dimmed why because there is lack of diversity so that is also true an organism and an ecosystem or a biotic community which is more diverse has more chances of survival so can i say diversity is a hedge against any eventuality this was also said by arthur tansley that diversity is a kind of hedge hedge means a kind of buffer or a kind of protection against eventuality it means suppose if there is some climatic extremes a ecosystem which is mostly made out of reptiles it would vanish in no time 
and that is what has happened when that meteoroid struck near Mexico and all the dinosaurs they perished it didn't happen like this that as the meteoroid fell and it blasted and because of that sound the dinosaurs died it happened like this as the meteoroid it struck near about Mexico you see 65 million years ago so as it struck there it created a kind of a nuclear explosion this generated a lot of radiation and it also created a lot of dust in the air as dust was created you can understand the temperatures were dropped why because of increased ray leaf scattering do you remember that and because of the radiation leak that happened the dinosaurs could not make it now you see one thing that in astronomy we measure distances in astronomical units or we measure distances in terms of light years clear so say for example if there is a planet which is 65 million light years what does that mean it means light would take at least that much time to reach that planet and suppose that planet that would be extremely far but imagine that that planet has a strong telescope by which they are keeping an eye on us suppose but because the organisms feel that we live in harmony and here people are fighting on silly issues so we don't want to in, in, uh, establish a communication with them just suppose hypothetically whatever it is and suppose they are seeing it from the telescope so when they see towards the earth what do they see they see dinosaurs because the light which traveled 65 million years ago reached them now so they are seeing what dinosaurs do you understand this so anyhow so you write one line greater the diversity of the community greater the diversity of the community <coughs> greater are its chances of survival greater are its chances of survival as diversity is a hedge h e d g e hedge against any eventuality is a hedge against any eventuality so you understand organisms something which has morphology physiology and and what about populations group of organisms of same species different species ecosystem now to understand this ecosystem we must understand what is a system a system is something which is separated from its environment by a boundary now depending upon the nature of that boundary whether it's porous or it's solid the system can be open or a closed system all systems have elements and there are links between these elements and when there are links there are flows like say for example think of a transportation system each city might become a element whereas each link would be the roads the railways etc and the number of trucks or the number of buses that are moving would be the flows and what would be their boundary maybe the administrative boundary like trucks from india may not go to other countries but it may under some special permit conditions so we would say that it is partially an open system so look at this ecosystem is nothing but an ecological system it means the components in ecosystems are of two kinds abiotic and biotic and these components are nothing but elements and there is interaction between these elements and there is interaction between them and other aspects of their environment also at times you can understand an ecosystem may interact with another ecosystem ecosystems several times there are additions to them because of new organisms getting added and sometimes there are deletions to them because of older organisms going extinct into the ecosystem do you understand this now an ecosystem where the rate of extinction is faster than the rate of enrichment is an ecosystem which is fragile do you understand this so you right an ecosystem where the rate of extinction is faster than the rate of enrichment an ecosystem where the rate of extinction rate of extinction is faster 
than the rate of enrichment such an ecosystem is a fragile ecosystem it's a fragile ecosystem and can you say which ecosystem is fragile can you give an example of a fragile ecosystem coral reefs are fragile okay any other example any other example give me an example of an ecosystem which is fragile Forest. forests mangroves coral reefs okay the turtles you are saying olive ridley turtles okay okay boss ab dekho all ecosystems are fragile all ecosystems are fragile extinction to kya hai ek din mein ho sakta hai but regeneration will take time only the degree of fragility differs so you write one line all ecosystems are fragile all ecosystems are fragile only the degree of fragility differs only the degree of fragility differs did you get that of all the biomes the boreal forests or the taiga forests are the most fragile so you write one line of all the biomes the boreal forests or the taiga biome the boreal forests or the taiga biome where are they found yes in siberia near siberia region are the most fragile clear now see so ecosystem is nothing but it's an ecological system which consists of abiotic and biotic components and we have already understood that abiotic also includes dead organic that's why humus is a part of abiotic whereas biotic is one which has life now see one thing when a biological community is superimposed over a physical habitat it becomes an ecosystem isn't that so now you see ecosystems they are either natural ecosystems or man made ecosystems like say for example an aquarium would be a man made ecosystem what about an agricultural field a man made ecosystem but we are dealing only with natural ecosystems so write one line ecosystems can be either natural or man made could be either natural or man made i have a question which kind of ecosystems would have a greater productivity natural ecosystems or man made ecosystems which would have a greater productivity i'm not saying production i'm saying productivity are you sure about it yes definitely man made why not because you can control the input and thus you can control the output so you right <clears throat> man made ecosystems are generally more productive generally more productive as inputs can be controlled as inputs can be controlled okay now you tell me that a forest it depletes the soil more quickly or shifting cultivation shifting cultivation would be a man made ecosystem what destroys the soil quickly it means what is more productive is more exhaustive so you write one line man made ecosystems are also more exhaustive are also more exhaustive it means they exploit the nature more that is they exploit the nature more are more exhaustive that is they exploit the nature more i see there's a famous ecologist his name odum and odum has categorized or classified ecosystems he says that ecosystems broadly speaking are of two types one ecosystem which are solar powered 
and those ecosystems which are run by other sources of energy mostly given by man do you understand this solar powered ecosystems can also be say man made ecosystems like say for example a paddy field it is driven by the sun's heat and the moisture and the rainfall also occurs due to the heat of the sun so such systems are man made solar powered ecosystem do you understand this now we cannot call these ecosystems as natural ecosystems although they are driven by solar energy but there are some ecosystems where the productivity is more when compared to other ecosystem and we would say like say for example that there are two factories both the factories incur 10 rupee production cost to make a product of 12 rupee if suppose to one factory the government decides to give or extend a subsidy and the production cost fall to 5 rupee from 10 rupee in that second factory will the rate of production go up yes so can i say it is a kind of government financial subsidy that has incentivized production in the second factory similarly you would see the nature has given some subsidies to some of the ecosystem let's say for example coral reefs <coughs> in coral ecosystems nature has helped the polyps to establish a mutualistic symbiotic partnership with the zooxanthellae alga and that's why you see it's a kind of subsidy similarly you see that do you remember eshuris yes in eshuris you see there are no sediments and thus coral reefs can grow there but they do not grow because of the freshness of water do you understand this but because of sediment free location you can understand there can be more fishes in and around there so such ecosystems say coral reefs mangroves tidal marshes etc they are all nature subsidized solar powered ecosystem and the scholar is odum so right one line odum has classified the ecosystems odum has classified <coughs> the ecosystems into solar powered and systems driven by other sources of energy and systems driven by other sources of energy now put a semicolon and write naturally subsidized solar powered naturally subsidized solar power ecosystems are the most productive naturally subsidized solar powered ecosystems are the most productive among all natural ecosystems <coughs> among all natural ecosystems clear you have one more category here which is a landscape now what is a landscape a landscape is a huge unit of land a landscape do you understand that it was nothing but an amalgamation of different landforms yes so it's a landscape is one which is of huge dimensions and it is divided into different sections and each section is an ecosystem do you understand this so a landscape is a huge unit of land which is separated from other similar units by natural boundaries ab ye baat dhyan mein rakhne wali hai that they are not separated from other landscape by man made boundaries but by natural boundaries say like mountains rivers forests deserts etc so you see that landscapes i'm again repeating a landscape is a huge piece of land which is separated from other similar landscapes by natural boundaries and the landscape itself is a mosaic of patches every patch is an ecosystem an example would be the himalayan landscape now you tell me the combination of organisms or the community that you will find in say uttarakhand or himachal pradesh will it be very similar to what you find in sikkim and arunachal pradesh will it be similar like <laughs> do you have the kashmiri stag there also in arunachal pradesh no because the climate is also changing 
as you are going from west to east, you are also coming towards the tropics and therefore the temperature is increasing, the moisture is also increasing. Remember the Bay of Bengal branch of Indian monsoons? So what I am saying that the same landscape may have more than one ecosystems. Do you understand this? Greater the diversity of a landscape, more attractive it is for ecotourists. Yes? And that's why you see that everyone wants to explore the Himalayas. Aisa koi nahi hota, jo bulta hai ki chuttiyo mein chalo thar desert chale. Sabko Ladakh jana. A passion ho na ho, zabrasti ja rahe. See you right. A landscape, a landscape is a large unit of land. A landscape is a large unit of land which is separated from other similar units which is separated from other similar units by natural boundaries by natural boundaries every landscape is a mosaic of patches Every landscape is a mosaic of patches. And every patch represents an ecosystem. Every patch represents an ecosystem. Example, you can write Himalayan landscape. The Himalayan landscape. So let us understand this biome. Biomes are regional ecosystems. Biosphere is the global ecosystem. Landscape are local ecosystem whereas biomes are regional ecosystem. Now biomes can be or regional ecosystems can be of two types. They can be terrestrial regional ecosystem and aquatic regional ecosystem. When we use the term biome we only indicate towards terrestrial regional ecosystem. Now there are 11 biomes and we will learn the biomes in detail when we go to them. But say for example, have you heard about the tundra biome? Have you heard about the equatorial rainforests? Have you heard about the west margin hot deserts, the mid latitude deserts? Now how do we name a biome? We name a biome either on the basis of the most dominant species like tropical evergreen rainforests. Clear? or we name it on the basis of its climate, say desert biome. A desert is a place where the evaporation rates are much faster than the precipitation. Or we make a combination of both, tropical, evergreen and what kind of forest? Rainforests. Clear? See right? <coughs> Biomes are terrestrial regional ecosystems, are terrestrial regional ecosystems. <coughs> so keep this in mind that regional aquatic ecosystem though they are biomes but we do not associate the term biome with them and how many biomes? 11 biomes. So in bracket you can write 11 biomes. So we'll go into them deta in detail in some time. But look at this biosphere. Biosphere is a definition that it is the sphere where Lithosphere, hydrosphere and atmosphere overlaps. It means wherever life is possible that becomes a part of biosphere. Biosphere is the global ecosystem. So you just write one line, biosphere is the global ecosystem. See, it means this that if I have to put this mathematically, then biosphere is nothing but summation of all the biomes, 1 to 11 and I should write 1 to n because I am including aquatic as well. So you can write this, biosphere is nothing but the summation of all the biomes, terrestrial and aquatic. So you tell me. Do you understand organisms? You understand populations, community, ecosystem, landscape, biomes and biosphere. And we also understand organism is the 
smallest unit whereas biosphere is the largest unit of inquiry in ecology. Let us move to the next thing and that is habitat and ecological niche. Let's see how do we define a habitat? What is a habitat? How, how do you define a habitat? Yes. Yes, a habitat is that thing. A place where an organism lives is its habitat. Can two organisms share the same habitat? It means the same space can act as habitat for different organisms. And different organisms may exploit the environment in a different manner. Clear? And you can see that habitats, the same space may be utilized in different manner. What do I mean by this? It means there are some animals which live below the surface. There are some animals which live on the surface, but they live at the same place. Isn't it so? So habitats, you see, have you heard about this fragmentation of habitats? Say for example, you construct a road through the jungles. You fragment the habitats. How many times have you seen this scene? maybe in some of the television channels or in newspaper or elsewhere that when the people are crossing and you see a lioness with her cubs moving across the road or an elephant and an elephant group moving across the road because you have moved into their territory and this not only enhances the propensity of man animal conflict but also shrinks the ecosystem do you understand this? Habitat fragmentation is the single largest reason for the loss of biodiversity. So, a line like Lobus. Habitat destruction or fragmentation rather. Habitat destruction and fragmentation is the single largest reason. Is the single largest reason. for the loss of biodiversity, for the loss of biodiversity. Now, so we are saying that habitat is nothing but the place where an organism live. Habitat can be terrestrial habitats or aquatic habitat and two organisms can use the same habitat differently. Ye line likh lo. Two organisms may use the same habitat differently. And why do they use it differently? Why do they use it differently? Because of the physiological and morphological makeup. No, no. Why do they use it differently? Differential requirements. Okay, no, that's a good line. But you see one thing that they use it differently either they want to save themselves or they want to survive survive by catching a prey so either due to competition or they do not want to fall prey to someone like say for example two organisms when they compete against each other you can understand they would never catch the prey so both of them will die and you can say they would be starved to death so what happens is they divide the, the use of the habitat in terms of time. It means what? Like say one organism <coughs> say that I will hunt during the day and you hunt during the night. There is a treaty and there is signature on it. It is common, natural, you can say understanding. And that is what happens. Therefore some organisms develop nocturnal habitats. Maybe you could understand that think of something. Are you aware of bats? Now bats are the birds, bats are birds, no they are mammals and they are, they can fly. It means they are odd one out in the avian category. It means the birds if you see, the mammals, the bats, they, they stand out. Because if you understand all the birds ka ek, jise hai, convention ho. and odds all say that we would do this. Suppose decision ho hai, migration karna chahiye ki nahi karna chahiye. And say all the birds say, I, yes, we should. The bat will do like this, will not open its mouth. 
because if it opens its mouth it has teeth whereas birds do not have teeth so it is the odd one out so ho sakta hai ek hostility ban jaye bat ke liye to usne seedha rasta nikala ki raat ko chalenge <laughs> din ko zyada khatra hai raat ko chalenge aur dusri baat kiya ki seedhe baith gaye to ho sakta hai dikh jaye kisi ko kyunki kuch pehredari wo ghoomte rehte raat ko jaise aul to ulta latak jayenge और खुद को बंद कर लेंगे ऑर्गेनिजम्स मे यूज द ऑर्गेनिजम्स मे यूज द सेम हैबिटेट डिफरेंटली इधर इन यूज द सेम हैबिटेट डिफरेंटली इधर इन स्पेशल टर्म्स और इन टेम्पोरल टर्म्स स्पेशल टर्म्स और इन टेम्पोरल टर्म्स टेम्पोरल आई ऑलरेडी एक्सप्लेन लाइक से फॉर एग्जाम्पल बैट्स एंड दे हैव नॉक्टर्नल हैबिटैट्स स्पेशल मीन्स सम ऑर्गेनिजम्स विच लिव सब सर्फेस एंड सब ऑन दिस सर्फेस दैट वुड बी स्पेशियल नाउ लुक एट दिस निश नाउ दिस क्वेश्चन इज वेरी पॉपुलर इन यूपीएससी प्रोलिम्स दैट the ecological niche is and they would give you some options now generally niche means role it is the function that an organism plays in an ecosystem that is its niche but that is a very narrow definition of niche niche is actually a combination of three r's they are role resource and a range now what is this role the role is what kind of function has been assigned to you in the ecosystem like say for example in a football team some are given the role of attacking whereas some are given the role of defending so there are different roles if the defender goes on charge you can understand that maybe they will lose the match so what do we mean by this role is what part do you play in the ecosystem if your part is the most important part then you are the keystone species do you understand this and if you are removed from the ecosystem then definitely the ecosystem will collapse resource means resources can be biotic or abiotic both so the amount of biotic and abiotic substance that you use since your birth to the final goodbye is your resource base do you understand this it means the total amount of biotic and abiotic things used by an organisms during its lifetime are its resources and organisms which require a lot of resources will be more prone to extinction one which can survive on a bit it has more chances of survival range means that range can be with respect to either a biotic or a abiotic component suppose take a abiotic component say temperature if suppose the lower atmospheric temperature increases to say 100 degrees celsius maybe humans will find it extremely difficult to survive unless they help themselves with technological interventions they would find it really difficult similarly if it goes minus 100 yet we will find it very difficult to survive it means we have a range on which we can survive and this range where you say these are the two extremities of temperatures in negative and positive this is where you can survive and the mean of it would be the best kind of temperature so here the population size and the individuals they would be the strongest and as you go towards the extreme you can understand the population sizes would dwindle and beyond the extremes there is no population negative population so you can say it becomes almost zero we can divide this into two or three sections this would be the optimum zone of growth this would be the zone of stress and this would be the zone of extinction now think of this that uh, dinosaurs when the meteorite hit hit the mexico coast and you can understand it generated a lot of radiation radiation means heat and dinosaurs they are reptiles and they are ectotherms they are cold blooded as they are cold blooded their internal body temperature gets modified due to the external environmental temperature and they could not cope up with such high temperature and they vanquished because of it are you clear with that so i'm saying 
that NISH is actually a combination of three R's. They are the role, the resource and the range. Just one line. Likh lo. If the role assigned to an organism is the most important, if the role assigned to an organism is the most important, in the ecosystem is the most important in the ecosystem that organism becomes a keystone species become a keystone species that is if they are removed if they are removed the entire ecosystem collapses the entire ecosystem collapses. Now look at this. Let's go back to our simple ecosystem which consisted of uh, grasses, deer and lion. And you tell me which is the keystone species? Are the grasses keystone species? If we remove the grasses, the ecosystem collapse? Yes. If we remove the deer? Yes. The ecosystem will collapse at least for the lion. Even the grasses will die in the long term. Why? Why? Because there would be exorbitant growth in their population. They would exhaust the soil and they would soon perish. Because soil enrichment, it takes time, sometimes thousands of years. And you understand that this top soil, it may take 10,000 years to form one centimeter, but it can get washed away. Six to seven centimeters can get washed away in one afternoon. And if all the soil, if I remove it and put it on the ocean floor, because ultimately it goes to the ocean floor, what would happen to humanity? It will extinct in no time. And that's why we say in environment, everything is linked to everything else. And if you remove one thing, something else may get destroyed. Now think of this. If I remove the lion, will the ecosystem survive? Maybe for some time, but in the long run, it will still, because the deer population will keep on growing and they will exhaust the grasses. So, which organism is the keystone species? Oh, the yes. so, e keystone species, this looks very good on paper. When, when you go in the real world, you do not know that whether this organism is the keystone species or that organism is a keystone species. So, when you have all the advertisements which says, ki dhun dhun ke mare, or sham ke vakti sare machar aate hai. <laughs> Maybe you are removing a keystone species. Who knows? Do you understand this? So write one line. Machcharo ko nahi khud ko mita rahe ho. So write one line. Keystone species are really hard to distinguish. Are hard to distinguish. Now, look at this. So I'm saying, yes. Yes? Human being is a keystone species. Yes, definitely. At least for some lesser organisms which are less mobile and find themselves in uh, ecosystems full of predators. Human beings have made them pets. I'm talking about dogs and cats. And you see that key. We do not understand at times that we think that we are doing good to the organism, but maybe we are doing bad to the organism by our love and affection. What do I mean by that? Say for example, suppose if you make the puppy eat bindi, that's a crime. Isn't that so? It's like making you eat grass. It's like Suppose it's a Sunday and the puppy is waiting for something else and you give lo palak paneer. <laughs> the puppy will think, to paneer khila rahe the roj, aaj palak bhi dal usme. <laughs> So, at times you see that you distort the uh, physiology of several organisms out of love and affection. <laughs> now, look at this. This is what I'm talking about. So, you understand this habitat? is the physical environment in which an organism lives. It's the address of an organism. Many habitats make up the environment. 
A single habitat may be common for more than one organism which have similar requirements. For example, a single aquatic habitat may support a fish, frog, crab, phytoplankton and many others. The various species sharing a habitat does have the same address, example forest, river, etc. Now you can see this is ecological niche. It is a combination of resource, range and rules. So niche is 3 hours. But if suppose a question is asked, you can be almost relaxed with respect to it that the question would be more with respect to rule, also known as function. Now you see this. Can you see this is the area of greatest abundance? Because this is the range of optimum survival or optimum environmental conditions. And you can see that this is the zone of stress and this is where the species are absent. Now you tell me that if an organism has a larger range, then this curve would be more like this. If it has a lesser range, it would be more like this. So a broad curve indicates what? Indicates what? It indicates that the species has adapted more to different environmental conditions. So you write one line. A broad tolerance curve, a broad tolerance curve indicates that the species, that the species has adapted to varying has adapted to varying climatic aise kar lo geoclimatic kar lo geoclimatic conditions geoclimatic conditions and thus it has better chances of survival and thus it has better chances of survival and thus it has better chances of survival. Now, look at this, that if you see for example, once the human population in Africa was white, but it turned black because it wanted to adjust with the environment. That is why it, there was change and this change can I say is more of a racial change. It means, have you seen that, are you aware of the rattlesnake? Have you heard about the rattlesnake? And it has a rattling sound at the fag end of its tail by which you can understand it warns its skin and also attracts the mate. Now you see, all snakes, do they have rattles? No. It means that some organisms, they develop some characteristics because they want to survive in a particular kind of environment. Rattlesnake, where do you find them? They are most common in, in which part of, or in which continent? USA, where? Texas. And the Texas rattlesnake is one of the most dangerous snakes in the entire world. But anyhow, you see <coughs> that several times, you understand populations? Several times populations, they adapt to a certain environmental condition. Do you understand this? And such locally adapted populations are known as ecotypes. So, listen to this one more time. Locally adapted populations. It means adapted to what? Environmental conditions. Locally adapted populations are known as ecotypes. And a certain ecotype might exhibit a certain characteristics. Clear? So you write one line. Locally adapted populations. Locally adapted populations are known as ecotypes. Are known as ecotypes. And do not get confused between ecotypes and ecotones. Ecotones are transitional biomes. Whereas ecotypes are locally adapted genetic populations. Clear? Now, look at this. When we say that how do you understand that there is some influence of the climate? Is there any influence of the climate on your gene? Yes, there is. Now, 
you think of this that if I break down your gene or if I check your genetic makeup and if I find the expressions of climate over it, it means the environment's impact over your genetic makeup. Like I told you that people in Africa were once white. Now, okay, tell me, can the Neanderthal, have you heard about the Neanderthal? Cro-Magnon, can they interbreed with Cro-Magnons? Have you heard about the Cro-Magnons? The Cro-Magnon man, have you heard about it? Yes. Neanderthals? Okay, how many have studied biology? Okay, few. How many have anthropology as their optional? <laughs> what is this uh, Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon man thing? What, can they interbreed? We're saying both are men. Yeah. Can they? Can they interbreed? It's like the lion and the tiger. The liger. Can you understand this? But generally they don't. But it is said there is one famous theory which says that the Cro-Magnon man invaded southern France and there the last group of Neanderthals lived. The Neanderthals could not develop one thing which the Cro-Magnon developed and thus they survived. And that was politics. Cro-Magnons developed politics and they developed language. And for politics, language, sometimes speaking of it, sometimes not speaking about it becomes very important. But anyhow, leave that part. So I'm talking about, see, in your gene, there may be some expression of the environment. Now, this expression is known as phenotype. Phenotype is the expression that your gene exhibits with respect to the environment. And you can understand, like if you find the fossil of a woolly mammoth, you understand why it had wools over its body because it lived in cold climates. Are you clear with that? So that would be a phenotype. Now, if the same species showed different phenotypes, I would say that it lived under different environments. And I would say that I can stretch that species more over the surface of the earth. And something when you can stretch it, you say it is more plastic or elastic. Do you understand this? So I would say that that organism has a greater phenotypic plasticity. Is that given in your notes? Phenotypes and phenotypic plasticity? Okay. Is it? Okay. Now look at this. Look at this. This is what is phenotype. I'm saying is the expression of the environment over the genes. Okay. So you write one line this. In evolutionary ecology, I'm dictating it for you. You can write if you want. In evolutionary ecology, an ecotype, an ecotype, sometimes called ecospecies, sometimes called ecospecies, describe a genetically distinct, a genetically distinct geographic variety. Put a semicolon and write just one line. Genetically adapted local populations are ecotypes. Genetically adapted local populations are ecotypes. And you see this, that phenotype is nothing but the expression. Phenotypic plasticity refers to some of the changes in an organism's behavior, morphology and physiology in response to a unique environment. Phenotypic plasticity is the ability of one genotype to produce more than one phenotype when exposed to different environments. One organism which has a greater phenotypic plasticity has greater chances of survival. Let's so write one line. An organism which has greater phenotypic plasticity. An organism which has greater phenotypic plasticity. has greater chances, has greater chances of survival, greater chances of survival
now you tell me that which kind of organisms would have the greatest phenotypic plasticity would it be reptiles would it be birds would it be mammals it would be what would have greatest phenotypic plasticity it would be birds or mammals or reptiles did you understand my question yes sir which would have a greater phenotypic plasticity i repeat birds mammals reptiles how many say mammals raise your hands okay there are few others feel it is reptile or birds acha dekho ek baar batao that if your internal body temperature gets affected by external body temperature or external environmental temperature will you be able to go to harsh climates no but if your internal body temperature is more or less constant and it is independent of the external environmental temperature you can adapt to different environments and then i would say that you have some sort of internal mechanism of maintaining your temperature this is known as homeostasis and such organisms are known as endotherms or warm blooded so mammals are all warm blooded are there mammals in the sky say the bat are there mammals in under the ocean yes the whales and there are mammals all around in all the biomes do you understand this so mammals have the greatest phenotypic plasticity right one line mammals have the greatest phenotypic plasticity mammals have the greatest phenotypic plasticity now think of this uh sometimes you would see that the same habitat would create different niches means would give different roles to different organisms also see one thing <coughs> that if there are more organisms the niche is broadened or narrowed if there are more organisms if the ecosystem is more complex or the biological community more diverse then will there be narrow niches or broad niches narrow niches acha ye baat batao ki do you understand niche and think in terms of role broad role means like how leonardo da vinci was he was a polymath remember and eratosthenes he was also a polymath or you can think of uh, artists in the west say for example some singers in the west they are also musicians they are also songwriters and all those kind of things but here we have more specialists than generalists so if the number of people are less in a home one person perform more than one task matlab market bhi aapko hi jana hai aur fridge mein pani mein bottle bhar ke bhi aapko hi rakhna hai ye sabse bada issue hai ghar pe to ki kaun rakhega so but if you suppose you are the eldest sibling and if suppose ki eldest sibling ye bol de ki bhai ko ya behan ko chote ki pani ab tum bharoge बस वो तो फिर जैसे बादशाह अपने फरमान निकालते थे वैसा हो जाता है और फिर वही करता है सब कुछ प्रोवाइडेड दैट डे कम्स व्हेन द यंगर वन कम्स टू नो सम इम्पोर्टेंट राज अबाउट द एल्डर वन तो देखते कि बड़े भैया आज पानी भर रहे हैं सो लुक एट दिस सम सेइंग दैट थिंक अबाउट the ecosystem which is more complex if it has more complex then the niches would be narrow and can i say thus that as you move from the poles towards the equator the niches become generally speaking more and more narrow as you move from the west towards the east the niches become generally more and more narrow at least in the tropical region and from east to west in the temperate region why because you have westerly winds remember so remember this that the tropical evergreen rainforests 
have the narrowest of niches and when you have narrow niches you are specialists और जब आप स्पेशलिस्ट बन जाओगे तभी तो आप सरवाइव करोगे क्योंकि समझ लो कि एक सोसाइटी में सिर्फ एक ही इंसान है जिसको कंप्यूटर चलाना आता है मतलब वो स्पेशलिस्ट है और ऐसा और कोई नहीं है सो एवरीवन वुड बी डिपेंडेंट ऑन दैट पर्सन बट इफ सपोज देर आर मेनी पीपल हु कैन रन द कंप्यूटर्स देन वन हु इज रनिंग इट एट द कॉस्टलीस्ट प्राइस विल बी थ्रोन अवे टू अंडरस्टैंड दिस सो वॉट डू वी मीन बाई दैट इट मीन्स the equatorial biome have more specialists than any other and if there are more specialists then all of them are keystone species so there are generally more keystone species in lower latitudes than in upper latitudes clear so you write one line Is it because of the uh, because of the density the number would rise yes That's yes now can i say altitude mimics latitude so keystone species the numerical strength of them will grow in lower altitudes and will dwindle in upper altitudes so you write one line as the ecosystem or biological community as the ecosystem or biological community becomes more complex as the ecosystem or biological community becomes more complex the niches become more narrower the niches become more narrower put a semicolon and write narrow niches promote specialists narrow niches promote specialists and you understand that <coughs> specialists have a direct relationship with survival because if you remove a specialist from an ecosystem then the ecosystem will collapse so the specialist is a keystone species so you write in bracket all specialists are keystone species all specialists are keystone species <coughs> clear now are you aware of this angry bird yeah now look at this the angry birds the fundamental niche is the entire tree but the realized niche it means specific elevations can you see they have different requirements so they live at different parts of the tree so you write one line just species may have same fundamental niche species may have same fundamental niche and yet may survive under different different realized niches yet may survive and yet may survive under different realized niches can you give me an example where you will find such kind of thing apart from the tree sir the african savannas uh, hmm. there uh, zebras wild beast and mm. also uh, buffaloes white white buffaloes they yes. see uh, different level levels of grass okay that so okay so, uh, okay that would be an example also think about a pond mm. a pond would have different layers remember benthic organisms mm. yes. yes by the way, way the wild beasts the wild beasts are the most successful organisms of the african savanna because their biotic potential is maximum now what do we mean by biotic potential biotic potential means your ability to reproduce under non limiting environmental conditions now see whenever an organism tries to produce more and more environment brings a check and check can be either a abiotic or a biotic check say for example throws in a predator into the ecosystem because the predator will be attracted and it is the nature which is throwing the predator into the ecosystem and thus it acts as a check do you understand this biotic potential therefore of the wild beast is maximum in the african savanna and that's why you see they are one of the most successful mammals that have adapted to tropical grasslands just write one line biotic potential is the ability of an organism 
Biotic potential is the ability of an organism to reproduce under non-limiting environmental conditions, under non-limiting environmental conditions. And you know that no organism ever reaches biotic potential because that is a utopia because nature will not tolerate it, see right. No organism ever reaches biotic potential, never ever reaches, no organism ever reaches biotic potential. So, अच्छा एक बात बताओ हैबिटेट और निश ये दोनों चीज क्लियर है अब क्लियर अब इससे तीन या चार क्वेश्चन तो आ ही जाएंगे अच्छा देखो कितने क्वेश्चन आ सकते हैं कॉलेज से लेट्स थिंक लाइक दैट एट बेस्ट आई एम सेइंग एट बेस्ट एंड इफ यू एनालाइज द क्वेश्चन पेपर्स यू विल आल्सो फाइंड द सेम थिंग दैट एट बेस्ट यू विल हैव 15 क्वेश्चंस बट द रेंज इज बिटवीन 12 टू 15 इन 100 15 इज टू मच now you see one thing that you cannot do away with ecology why because the forest services and the civil services now have a joint first stage and in the forest services they will ask some environmental questions so ecology thus becomes a very important part of your syllabus all the other subjects are equally important but ecology is you can clearly you can find a logic behind the inclusion of ecology then now if you look at these 15 questions you will see say let us consider the best case 15 questions you will see that nearly 8 to maybe at times it goes to 10 and I am saying when the number of questions are 15, 8 maybe you will find they are hardcore basics like these kind of things what we are reading. They would be more or less from that part. The 2, rest to 2 maybe 9 and 10 I am talking about, they would be basics plus current affairs. Some sentence would be a basic sentence, one or two current affair kind of thing would be included in it. Like say the International Whaling Commission, do you remember that? And then finally there would be five questions provided, there are 15 number of questions which are thorough current affairs. And in that also you can imagine at least two to three would be climate change, ozone control, the protocols and the conventions. And there are three important conventions, the UNF, triple C, the CBD and the UNCCD convention to combat desertification, clear? So these are the three conventions or Sara cheez isi ke ho jayega, don't worry about it. So do you understand this? So therefore if you see these eight questions, do se teen to isi se aayenge jo humne ab tak padh liya, just keep this in mind. A question aa sakta hai biome se, koi ek particular biome they would give you that the following are the characteristics of which biome? Do you understand this? Maybe some sentences and in options A, B, C, D, the different biomes. Do you understand this? So see, this is a very simple examination. I always maintain. This is a very simple examination. And there was a time when people would not prepare for pre. And those were the best days, I would say. Uh, when people would not prepare for pre, rather they would prepare for means and pre-preparation would happen automatically but those people did one thing very good that they revised for pre but of now late I am seeing among aspirants that they are very pre-obsessed aadhe se zada baad bhi aapas mein yehi karte hain aray chodo baaki cheeze pehle pre to nikle yeh cheez ab sochna chahiye lekin woh pehle din se sochne lag jate hain and you understand that Suppose you do not qualify preliminary examination, ek to jo dhakka lagta hai, wo to alag. But it dents your confidence as well. That am I good enough for this examination? You start asking questions. Why am I surviving then? If I cannot clear pre and usi dard mein koi aapko bolta hai ki chalo PSC ka form nikla hai, wo bhi dal do tum. To wo dal dete hai. Bank PO bhi dal dete hai ja ke. Jo jo nikalta hai, koi chale jate hai CDS, अबे उनको कोई अट्रैक्शन नहीं होगा डिफेंस से फिर भी वो डाल देते हैं सीडीएस और सारे एग्जाम दे देते हैं और सारे एग्जाम देके 
अगर समझ लो उसमें भी नहीं हुआ और कैसे होगा आपने नहीं की है तैयारी हो जाए तो अच्छी बात है बट सपोज नहीं हुआ तो इट डेंट्स योर कॉन्फिडेंस फर्दर कि आई हैव कम ऑल द वे फ्रॉम माई नेटिव टू बिकम एन आई ऑफिसर एंड कैन नॉट क्वालिफाई पीओ एग्जामिनेशन मतलब ये वैसी बात है कि जिंदगी भर मैंने क्रिकेट खेला और मैं वर्ल्ड कप के लिए नहीं सिलेक्ट हुआ फुटबॉल के ये कैसे हो सकता है मैं फुटबॉल में नहीं हो सकता तो क्रिकेट कैसे हो जाऊंगा सो द पॉइंट इज जस्ट कीप योर कूल एंड दिस डेली थिंग इफ वी डू दिस डेली थिंग एंड सी अगेन शॉर्ट टारगेट्स आर ऑलवेज इजी टू अचीव If I ask you make one chapati per day, you may do it. But if I say no chapatis for 29 days, but on the 30th day 30 chapatis together, then it becomes a challenge for you. Or yehi hota hai. All the current affairs material is like chapatis. You keep on collecting them, or fir time aata hai khane ka. Jab aapke appetite to kuch hogi, brain ki bhi to koi appetite hai. To jaise exhaust ho jaate ho aap, to fir ये होता है भविष्यवाणी शुरू हो जाती है ये नहीं आएगा ये तो नहीं आ रहा और फिर वो बताने भी लग जाते हैं कि ये क्या पढ़ रहे हो मिडिवल इंडिया दो क्वेश्चन उससे ज्यादा नहीं आएगा 98 तो सही हो नहीं है तो रिकॉर्ड ब्रेकिंग की बातें होने लगती हैं और कुछ लोग हैं जो in see the people who generally struggle are what kind i'm saying they are those who behave like an ias officer before becoming an ias officer who start behaving like an ias officer ki wo baatein bhi karte hain aapas mein ki kya baat kar rahe ho ias banna chahte ho aur aisi baatein karoge aur phone rakhte hue bhi apri ke liye ja rahe hain kal तो फोन रखते हुए ये बात करते हैं ठीक है अगली मुलाकात मसूरी में और पता चलता है वो सेंटर में ही मिल गए अरे तुम्हारा भी यही है हमने तो मसूरी सोचा था और फिर बोलते हैं नहीं अब अगली मुलाकात प्री के बाद बोलते हैं लगता है राजेंद्र नगर में ही फिर से होगी क्योंकि पढ़े तो दोनों नहीं थे वी बोथ ड्रेम्प्ट सी If you just dream, dreams are good. Hope is good. It's a good thing to have. But if you dream and do not work towards your dream, it means you do not live your dream. You will not succeed. Don't focus on the day. Don't think about D Day. We are always obsessed with it. What would happen on 31st of May? It should be a very normal day in your life. It should not be an extraordinary day. because under extraordinary circumstances anxiety creep in and when you are anxious you do not perform your best why because nervousness grows or as they say very popularly nervous ya jate hain so do you, there is a lot of nervousness that creeps in do you understand this so you see one thing dekho ek to shuruaat hoti hai ki hum kaise jayenge exam dene aur exam dene bhi jao to that would be a summer season now it doesn't mean that you pick your best shirt because it's your best shirt or sweater bhi pehen liya kyunki sweater was very lucky during the mains last mains <laughs> this bar bhi pehen liya wo pehno jisme aap comfortable ho maybe a t-shirt i'm saying those who are comfortable with that kind of attire maybe a t-shirt or a lower or something like that which gives you more comfort it's a summer's day सपोज द इलेक्ट्रिसिटी रन आउट इन द हॉल और कुछ तो हैं जो ऐसी क्रीस वाले पहनते हैं कि वो ऐसे जाते हैं फिर वो हिल नहीं पाते और क्रीस इतनी तगड़ी कि उनके खुद का हाथ कट जाए नई शर्ट है ना यहां यहां तक बटन बटन लगा के चले जाते हैं गर्मी हो सो दीज आर सिंपल थिंग्स दैट मेक यू रिलैक्स एंड एज यू आर मोर रिलैक्स यू विल क्वालिफाई you will don't worry about it okay now let us see this population you already understand population can you see population can get modified either due to natality mortality or migration 
We have also seen this in our human geography. So this is more or less similar to this. And you see natality is natality is a more comprehensive term which includes hatching, germination, birth, etc. Clear? And you see that natality and immigration adds to the total population, whereas mortality and emigration it deletes members from the uh, population. And you also understand the pull factors and the push factors. They would also be true with respect to natural migration, human migration and natural migration. Now look at this. If we classify the population and if we try to understand them, we can classify them in like, do you remember we said children, working population and the elderly? Yes. But that was more with respect to human geography. In ecology, we would say pre-reproductive group reproductive group and the post reproductive group and will that alter with respect to different organisms yes so you write one line the reproductive age group is not constant for all organisms the reproductive age group is not constant for all organisms now you see how does populations grow? Either they may have a J curve or they may have an S curve. Now, do you remember biotic potential? The maximum reproductive capacity of an organism under optimum environmental conditions. It means non-limiting environmental conditions. That is biotic potential. Now, think of this. Suppose this organism with the passage of time, the rate of population growth is very slow, but suddenly something occurs in the ecosystem which gives it a positive impetus and its population grows exponentially this exponential growth it grows exponentially and then the moment that important say positive factor it is removed from the ecosystem their population dwindle to zero or near zero levels that is the j curve and think of some insects they are of small in number but suddenly after the rainy season their growth spurs up and the moment the winters are about to begin the air turns dry and they fall because insects love what they want hot and humid conditions and in india tropical countries you can understand rainy season would be hot and humid clear southwest monsoons are hot and humid think of uh, months like july august they are very humid now look at this this is the j curve which is very common in some of the insects look at the s curve in the s curve again the population it increases very sluggishly but beyond a point due to some positive input either can be a biotic or abiotic aisa bhi ho sakta hai ki aapne kisi predator ko hata diya system se to ekdam se population shoot up ho gaya so think of this that if there is some positive input then you can understand that the population growth again exponentially and it tries to reach its biotic potential can you understand this but every ecosystem has a carrying capacity and it cannot carry beyond that and if you try to grow more than that then there would be competition and you would starve and die do you understand this and therefore this reaches to that carrying capacity but do not get confused between the carrying capacity and the biotic potential clear so you write one line this is the s curve and this would be more common in mammals. So you right. <coughs> the carrying capacity is the ability. The carrying capacity is the ability is the maximum ability Carlo is the maximum ability of an ecosystem to support ecosystem to support a community sustainably support a community sustainably carrying capacity is less or more than biotic potential carrying capacity biotic potential can be infinite yes, yes. see so right one line carrying capacities are generally lesser than biotic potentials are generally lesser than biotic potential. Now you can see this is growth without limits 
and it means you uh, keep on growing. That's an exponential growth. Whereas you see, there you have environmental resistance, which gives you logistic growth. It means logistic means now you have to grow by keeping in mind the resources available. That is logistic growth. And you see, this gives you an S curve. Okay. So you just write one line. As an organism tries to achieve its biotic potential, tries to achieve its biotic potential, environment produces a negative feedback. <clears throat> negative feedback or resistance negative feedback or resistance <clears throat> so do you understand the j curve and the s curve the s curve is more common in mammals so write one line the s curve is more common in mammals the s curve is more common in mammals while the j curve while the j curve is common in insects is common in insects and also have you seen this that just before the occurrence of rains the ants they go underground because they cannot survive such enormous heat especially in tropical climates ants they are endotherms or ectotherms it means warm blooded or cold blooded cold blooded so that's why they get affected by the external environmental temperature but you see <clears throat> that as they go subsurface, they have also made an adaptational change. It means they develop wings and during the rains they fly. You have ant flies and a number of them they grow. But the moment there is winter, you see that all of them they perish and you can see groups of dead such ant flies with time. Clear? <clears throat> now look at this ecosystem. This is Sir Arthur George Tansley or A.G. Tansley an English botan uh, botanist and a pioneer in the science of ecology. He coined the term ecosystem. Now the term ecosystem was coined by British ecologist A. G. Tansley in 1935 from eco meaning environment and system meaning a complex of coordinated units. I have already explained to you what is a system. Clear? See R. N. Lindemann. Now this is not very much common in GS but just for the sake of his definition, it's a very good definition says the term ecosystem applies to any system composed of physical, chemical, biological process within a space-time unit of any magnitude. That's the best definition you can think of an ecosystem. Clear? So you write one line. Ecosystem applies to any ecosystem applies to any system composed of any system composed of physical, chemical, biological processes, physical, chemical, biological processes within a space time, within a space time of any magnitude, within a space time of any magnitude. Now, you know, Ecosystem can be classified as terrestrial ecosystems and aquatic ecosystems. The components can be abiotic or biotic. And biotic generally can be divided into producers, consumers and decomposers. So as you arrange an ecosystem on the basis of their biota, you get different trophic levels. Trophic levels means the amount of food or energy available at one level. Now can you understand that if the producers have a greater productivity, the ecosystem would have larger number of trophic levels. Now, as you go upwards, the trophic levels, the amount of energy that is transferred gets reduced. Do you understand this? So, these are very basic things. Now, look at this. The ecosystem services. The ecosystem services. Is that given in your notes? Yes, yes, okay. Now, if you look at the ecosystem services, what kind of services the ecosystem does for you? Nutrient cycling, like carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, etc. Evolution, soil formation, spatial structure, primary production. 
all of that are services given by the ecosystem some of them are provisioning services it means the ecosystem provides you something like food fresh water fuel wood etc it regulates some things like say for example climate food disease and water regulation water purification pollination by pollination the organisms they determine how much would be the total production by the producers yes and then you have cultural services say for example religious or spiritual or even recreational now look at this that ecosystems all ecosystems give you services it not only gives you gives you goods but also services services say for example clean or purification of water now think of this if suppose you have a coastal area and you have the continental shelf slope and deep sea floor do you remember that and suppose just adjacent to it is a wetland and you can understand if the river enters it would stay some time over this and as it stays you can understand that the sediments would drop and so this area would get sedimented can you understand this similarly you can understand if the salt water it comes out this would act as a filter it would absorb some of the salts and make the water relatively fresh which would be good for terrestrial organisms so do you understand this so this wetland is actually the functions performed by a wetland are the services a provisioning services do you understand this they can also be considered as a regulating services like for example purification like what they did with respect to the saline water are you clear with that now if you see one thing that how do we measure productivity productivity is of two types primary productivity and secondary productivity but first let us come to production primary production and secondary production primary production means as the plants they use sunlight and produce their own food but see some organisms can produce food without sunlight as well they are chemosynthetic like say some bacteria which live on the benthos uh, habitat because there is no sunlight ek line likh lo do you remember we wrote that most of the organisms living in the benthic zone are blind yes, so write one more the organisms that can produce food <coughs> without sunlight are chemosynthetic organism are chemosynthetic organisms chemo synthetic chemo synthetic like photosynthetic chemo synthetic it means photosynthesis is nothing but a chemical reaction and what is the role played by sunlight in that catalyst it's just a catalyst so here you can say chemo synthetic bacteria the rate of food production would be lesser than photosynthetic organisms why because the sunlight is a good catalyst so write one line the rate of food production is higher in photosynthetic organisms is higher in photosynthetic organisms because sunlight is a good catalyst because sunlight is a good catalyst clear and you see one thing that productivity is nothing but production per unit area per unit time it can also be considered as sunlight captured per unit area per unit time it means kilo calories per meter square per year or grams because see when you produce something the production is in the form of biomass yes, yes. so the biomass produced per unit area per unit time is nothing but productivity when it is done by the producers it is known as primary productivity and the amount of biomass produced is known as production or primary production now look at this the consumers they depend on the producers as they depend on the producers you can understand they ingest the food and they convert the producers biomass into their biomass and that is known as secondary production so production by consumers are secondary production and the rate of such secondary production is known as secondary productivity and the production by producers are known as primary productivity but again you see a plant if it produces some food it also utilizes some of the energy safe for breathing 
so we have net primary production which is nothing but gross primary production minus respirational losses and the number of trophic levels in an ecosystem would depend upon how many how much is the net primary production rate because it is only the net primary product that is transferred to the next trophic level so you write one line it is only the net primary product <clears throat> it is only the net primary product which is transferred to the next trophic level <clears throat> The number of trophic levels depend upon the number of trophic levels depend upon the primary production and productivity. The primary production and productivity. <clears throat> now, look at this. So, I am saying that I can arrange the organisms into different trophic levels. You have producers, you have primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, quaternary, quinary and it goes on. And how many the level of consumers would depend upon what is the rate or efficiency of the producers. Do you understand this? Now we can arrange them into pyramids and such pyramids are known as ecological pyramids. There are three of them. The pyramid of numbers, the pyramid of biomass and the pyramid of energy. And you know that the pyramid of numbers can be a uh, erected or an inverted pyramid inverted pyramid means that the producers are less in number when compared to the consumers and think of a tree a tree ecosystem the tree is the producer and you have an inverted pyramid but at times you may have a pyramid which looks like this it means the producers are less in number when compared to the primary consumers but the secondary consumers are less in number when compared to the primary consumers. So you have a pyramid like this. Now think of uh, say a forest ecosystem. In a forest ecosystem over every tree there would be large number of species dependent. So you can understand that if you have the producers like this the primary consumers would be like this and the secondary consumers who would be feeding on the primary consumers would be lesser than them. So you get a pyramid like this. So can we say a forest ecosystem's pyramid is neither upright nor inverted so write one line a forest ecosystem's pyramid is neither upright nor inverted a f okay now think of this if it is a forest over every tree there would be more than one organisms there would be more than the tree so if you have the producers this many the primary consumers would be more than that but those organisms which feed on the primary consumers, they would be lesser in number when compared to them. So it would be something like this. So you get the pyramid like this. Can you understand this? So it is neither upright nor inverted. When you think about biomass, biomass, if you see that pyramid can also be upright or inverted. Let's say most of the ecosystems will have an upright biomass pyramid. But think of the ocean ecosystem where the producers are phytoplanktons and at any given time if you uh, measure their mass it would be lesser than the whales all the whales together then how does the oceanic ecosystem or the aquatic ecosystem at that scale survives because the rate of production is very high do you understand this so though at any given point of time the phytoplanktons are lesser in biomass but they grow very rapidly so there is never a food shortage do you understand this pyramid of energy <coughs> pyramid of energy is always upright because we know the law of conservation of energy that energy could neither be created nor it could be destroyed it could be only transformed from one form to another but that's one part of thermodynamics the other part says that no transformation is possible without the loss of energy generally speaking it is the 10 percent rule like suppose if you have absorbed 100 at the producer level energy the amount that is transferred to the next level is only 10 to the next level is only 1 to the next level is 0.1 so you can understand that that is what is the 10 percent rule generally speaking so pyramid of energy is always upright so you keep that also in mind 
and you see this is how energy flows in, eco in an ecosystem. The flow of energy is always linear or unidirectional, but the flow of matter is cyclic. That's why we are saying nutrient cycling. Are you understanding this? But energy, it comes from the sun, but do you return that energy to the sun? No, it is lost in the space. So the flow of energy in ecosystems is always unidirectional, right? This line. And this can this has been asked on several occasions. The flow of energy in an ecosystem is always unidirectional. The flow of energy in an ecosystem is always unidirectional. And you can understand that you have the primary producers, then you have primary consumers, secondary consumers, tertiary, quaternary, and as many as of them. And here you can see that they are herbivores, whereas they are all carnivores. So they are top carnivores, can I say? The tertiary and the quaternary consumers are top carnivores. So this is also true in aquatic or marine ecosystems. And generally speaking, there would be more trophic levels in the aquatic habitat or in the terrestrial habitat. It means diversity of organisms is more over the terrestrial habitat or over aquatic habitat. Half of the aquatic is dark zone. Which organism can survive in there? Do you understand this? And there is a greater spread and more homogeneity. But over terrestrial habitats, there is more diversity. Clear? So you write one line. Generally speaking, terrestrial habitats support greater trophic levels. Support greater trophic levels. <clears throat> now look at this, these are the pyramids, the ecological pyramids and this kind of pyramid is known as a spindle pyramid because it is neither upright nor inverted. You see that this is the pyramid of numbers which can be upright or which can be inverted. This is the pyramid of biomass which can be upright or can be inverted but the pyramid of energy is always upright and you see the 10% rule can you see the 10% rule that is being transferred to the next trophic level and if you look at this that this is the 10% rule this is the 10% rule where you can see that at every next level there is only 10% of the energy is transferred from the previous trophic level Clear? So keep this also in mind. Now look at this, we have also understood what is gross productivity and net productivity and we understand net primary production and net secondary production. Now one ecosystem which has good net primary productivity has greater chances of survival. Clear? Now look at this. Think about ecological interdependence and ecological efficiency. Now organisms, they depend on each other for food or say for example space, survival, shelter and reproduction. Let's say for example, plants are dependent on pollinators for reproduction. So this interdependency is known as ecological interdependency. We have several ecological efficiencies as well. Now what is this ecological efficiency? First we have the photosynthetic efficiency which is the gross primary production it means how much of it in percentage terms of the total incident energy like suppose you got 100 units of solar energy how much you were able to convert that amount into food say only 10 percent then your photosynthetic efficiency is only 10 percent do you understand this the base would be the solar heat net production efficiency the base would be gross primary production if you multiply it with 100 you change it into percentage assimilation efficiency it means how much food you have taken and how much energy or how much you have been able to convert that food into biomass that would be your assimilation efficiency now many times you would see that if you eat less and you will get more energy at times you eat too much yet you get very less energy mostly when proteins and nutrients are missing in your diet clear and that's why you see that have you heard this famous English phrase that small or less is more small is beautiful less is more if you eat less your chances of survival increase do you know this if you eat more 
देन योर चांसेस ऑफ सर्वाइवल दे रिड्यूस कहते भी यही है कि ये बहुत खाता था इसलिए ये परेशानी हुई इसको ऐसा कोई नहीं बोलता कि बहुत कम खाता था एंड दैट्स वाई यू वुड सी दैट यू ईट लेस बट यू ईट द राइट काइंड ऑफ फूड इट इज द काइंड ऑफ कैलोरी दैट आर यू आर टेकिंग गुड और बैड कैलोरी सो इकोलॉजिकल interdependencies here is a chart which shows different kind of ecological interdependencies but this is for the entire ecosystem and culture includes cultural landscape as well but you can think of only natural landscape and what is ecological efficiency it is the energy at a trophic level and the energy that was available at the previous trophic level like suppose you got 10 kilo calorie and this level you get only 1 kilo calorie so 9 kilo calories were lost so that is the ecological efficiency so these are four efficiencies which you must keep in mind and at times there can be some questions from these now we come to something called acclimatization versus adaptation acclimatization means that it is a slow and gradual adjustment to the changed environmental conditions like have you seen that if there is a big tournament coming up the teams they travel to that destination much earlier to get acclimatized acclimatization is reversible aisa nahi hai ki if you go to some uh, say suppose you go to scandinavia the temperatures the moisture everything is different from india so it doesn't mean that when you come back you find it very tough to adjust in india now this happens at times that those people who go to say europe or say britain or say us and canada and when they return back they find it difficult to adjust and they say that the city is not clean and all those kind of thing but jaane jab tak inka visa nahi laga tha ye bhi kachra fekte the and you see that they also find it difficult with the accent changes and all those <laughs> and it becomes really difficult for them to adjust back but i'm not talking about such kind of adjustment because these are sociological adjustments i'm saying physiological adjustment they do not find it tough that is acclimatization acclimatization it means that your biochemical processes you can alter them when you are found in new environmental conditions but given the old conditions return you can revert back it means acclimatization is reversible and every organism can acclimatize the rate of acclimatization only differs adaptation is where as a permanent change once you have adapted like someone have grown a tail that's an adaptation and it cannot be changed <laughs> do you understand this now adaptation these traits are irreversible and adaptation can be of three kinds morphological behavioral or physiological and once you have made these adaptations you can genetically transfer that trait it means uh, a young camel is also born with a hump do you understand this the hoofs it means that camel does not have to fight it out again with the environment and make those physiological and morphological changes is already born with them so adaptation is irreversible and is genetically transferred whereas acclimatization is reversible and it is not genetically transferred it doesn't mean that if your father has been to philadelphia and have lived there for a month very comfortably you will also find it very comfortable maybe he was a gentleman so <laughs> you can understand that it is not all the time that you can acclimatize every organism has to fight it out with respect to acclimatization but adaptation you see it's a gift from the parents so right one line adaptation is a gift from the parents now adaptations can be of two types adaptation in plants and adaptation in animals plants generally adapt to light regime light regime they are divided into two types heliophytes and sciophytes you might have seen in the tropical evergreen rainforests which have a stratified arrangement you have big tall trees and some undergrowth now these are heat tolerant because they are directly under the sun rays and it has a dense canopy whereas these are shade tolerant these are sciophytes whereas these are heliophytes adaptation to water scarcity and heat one would be ephemerals ephemerals are those kind say in deserts you will find that there are some seeds which remain under the surface in a moribund state for a lengthy of lengthy period of time but suddenly when the rains occur they grow and complete their entire life cycle within a very short period of time 
it means the germination the flowering the fruiting and the seed generation again before the moisture vanishes from the environment because if they wait as the environment turns dry their species will be extinct that is ephemeral ephemeral means suddenly but for a very short period of time and that's why you would see many times uh, they would say that uh, several uh, movements are ephemeral in nature they would just come for a short period of time and then they would vanish tap roots tap roots are those roots which go very deep in search of moisture or also can go very deep in search of nutrients if the soil is heavily leached clear succulents succulents are those like have you seen the cactus the cactus develops a leathery surface it means it develops a wax around it now the wax if you wax it around then you can understand you close the pores as you close the pores you reduce the transpirational losses and thus these organisms are known as succulents then you have xerophytes xerophyte or xerophytic adaptability is one thing any adaptability that helps in reduction of the moisture loss that is xerophytic adaptability like for ex example some organisms will reduce the size of their leaves will turn the leaves into needles will turn them into thorns or will have no leaves these are all xerophytic adaptability all found in desert biome ab ye question aa chuka hai that small leaves needles thorns no leaves which of the above are xerophytic adaptability all of them in fact clear ab ye question aaya tha 2015 i think or 14 then you have C4 pathway photosynthesis. Now, see, there are six types of photosynthesis, and C4 pathway is one among them. C4 pathway photosynthesis is one where you can perform better in distressed situations. Now, look at this: that plants having this pathway perform better in low soil water environment because this is adaptation to water scarcity. So, even if you have less moisture, this photosynthesis can be performed so ephemeral tap roots succulents xerophytes and c4 pathway photosynthesis is a type of adaptation to water scarcity and heat adaptation to aquatic environment there is something called erinchyma now what is this erinchyma you would see that there are leaves which have big pores and these are of floating vegetation now these big pores if you see they have dual purpose first is they help in absorbing oxygen from the atmosphere because in water you have only dissolved oxygen which is very difficult and you want gills for that and secondly that they give you buoyancy so that the leaf floats because you want to remain close to the sea surface because you want more sunlight so that is known as erinchyma there are large spaces in the leaves and petioles petioles is that stack which connects the leaf with the stem that is petiole clear so you have big holes and that is very common in phytoplanktons now then you have adaptation in saline environment salt glands now if you see have you heard about mangroves you see the mangroves they are mostly they live in anaerobic conditions and saline water so if they keep on extracting water from the soil they would accumulate salt in their body so they have salt glands through which they excrete salt back into the soil so as to maintain also if suppose you absorb more water you can reduce the amount of salt in your body but provided that water itself is not saline have you heard about osmoregulation osmosis it means how much amount of intake you want to take you if you can regulate that that is osmoregulation and osmoregulation is also one kind of such adaptation in saline environment vivipari vivipari means see some plants like mangroves See, the seeds germinate when they are on the tree tops, because if the seeds fall, the conditions here are very tough, saline, anaerobic. So they find it very difficult to germinate from here. This adaptation is known as vivipari. It means seeds germinate when they are on tree tops. Pneumatophores. Pneumatophores means respiratory roots, because here they are anaerobic conditions, and if here Have you seen that some plants have some roots? So, reshe reshe nikle hote hain. Now, these are respiratory roots through which you absorb atmospheric oxygen so that you can breathe. Also, you can understand you want carbon dioxide for the performance of photosynthesis, and you see that at times that this happens. 
but generally we say them respiratory roots because most plants use them for breathing purposes rather than food production but some of them may use it otherwise as well prop and stilt roots now if you see if this is totally flooded the surface would be very weak so if you just go like this to the plant the plant will fall so what the plants do the plants rather than developing the roots like this develop the roots like this if you stand like this with your legs apart you find more balance do you understand this and that's why the plants do this and this is known as stilt root adaptation to oligotrophic soils oligotrophic soils means soils which have low nutrients clear so what they do is say mycorrhizae is an organism it makes a symbiotic association with the roots and there are two kinds of them endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae endomycorrhizae they live inside the roots and ecto on the surface the mycorrhizae helps the plant in absorbing phosphorus and the plants in return give them food and the plants in return give them shelter so that is a symbiotic mutualistic uh, relationship so do you understand the different kinds of adaptation in plants and you see this many xerophytes may accumulate proline and amino acid in response to stress or chaperonins heat shock proteins these proteins maintain the structure and prevent de naturation complete change in the molecular structure of the proteins at high temperatures iska matlab ye hai ki some xerophytes and you understand what are xerophytes now these xerophytes they develop in their body proline now proline is nothing but a kind of amino acid amino acids are building blocks of proteins now under heat very stressful heat conditions the proteins their structure break and if the protein structure break you start start feeling lethargic and if you start feeling lethargic your survival becomes questionable then you become vulnerable so that's why when they develop this proline these prolines are amino acids which protect the structure of other proteins and do not allow denaturation do you understand this so this is the kind of thing which you must keep in mind do you understand acclimatization versus adaptation now let us see the adaptation in animals the adaptation first adaptation in animals is migration migration is also of two types obligate and facultative obligate means there is no other option facultative means you have option migration is say long distance or short distance it can be single or in groups like similarly you see that some arctic fern for example is the longest migrator it migrates from north pole to the south pole depending upon which pole has the summer season because it cannot live in the winter because the winters are dark at the poles do you understand this so migration is the movement from from one area to another area obviously in search of food and water or to avert competition now look at this there can be complete migration it means never return partial migration differential migration it means some species may never return some might and interruptive migration because as you are migrating suppose en route you found something more beautiful so you stopped there do you understand this so these are the different kinds of migration now as the birds migrate the birds and the fishes can migrate to the longest distance so they migrate either with the help of sun's position ab ye question bhi aa chuka hai or with earth's magnetic field some like the arctic ferns when they fly to din se raat bhi hoti hogi how do they maintain their di uh, their uh, direction by looking at the pole star but if it's a cloudy night they cannot look at the stars but they can go above the clouds but that would be very dangerous because the air pressure drops significantly so what they do is they try to see some landmarks kuch bhi ho sakta hai wo rivers ho sakte hain mountains ho sakte hain koi building bhi ho sakti hai agar bahut purani hai to so they see some landmarks and basis of that they come near ground and they fly at lower altitudes or even they can do it with the help of smells they have very strong uh, smelling power and thus you can see this is how they do the uh, migration but this landmark based is more near distance it is moderate distances with the help of smells but long distances with the help of sun or with earth's magnetic field or the pole star do you understand this and migration is of two types it can be uh, a choice for you or it is can be an obligation so obligate and facultative now look at this this is camouflage camouflage is you blend with the environment in such a manner that it is very difficult to distinguish you from the environment and why do you camouflage either to hunt or to avert a predator and can you see a fish here can you see a fish and you can understand it's very difficult it's in aquatic environment and this is a benthic fish and you can see it's mostly blind 
but it lays like that though it becomes very difficult and here also there is a stack and I hope you cannot see that because it has blended so perfectly here also there is a fly and you are finding it difficult to see and you can see that if there, there are so many of them say a pura garden ho aisa, so you would find really difficult camouflage is a kind of adaptation this is also a camouflage and you can understand that uh, this uh, wolf it camouflages it lives in the arctic there are other foxes also arctic fox which similarly camouflages and you see one thing hibernation and estivation hibernation is spending the winter in a dormant stage estivation is spending the summer in a dormant stage or you go underground during summers clear now you see this that hibernation is the type of winter sleep whereas estivation is the type of summer sleep that is what you have to keep in mind it is for the whole winter time it is of short duration the estivation and you understand that say some example bats birds mammals insects they all all they hibernate whereas bees snails earthworms and have you heard about uh, some organisms which go underground during summers because soil you remember is a bad conductor of heat so it does not take the heat to lower layers so you go and remain in the summer during dormant in the summer in dormant state because you want to save yourself from the extreme heat when you hibernate the uh, the rate of heartbeat drops metabolic rate also drops but during summers the rate of heartbeat should increase the respiratory rate should increase then only you can throw more heat out have you seen the dogs how do they behave during summers they always do respiration because they want to throw away the heat now what is this mimicry mimicry means there are two organisms in that one a model and the other a mimic now the model has some defense mechanisms whereas the mimic is defenseless and therefore what it does is it mocks the model whenever there is an attack by a predator and therefore it saves itself now mimicry is also of two types batesian and mullerian in batesian mimicry the mimic is defenseless but in mullerian it has defense mechanism like think of two organisms one has poison another one does not the one which does not have poison behaves like the one which has poison whenever it sees a predator and mullerian both have poison of different kinds yet one mimics the other because the predator is not aware of the poison of the second kind just to avoid the fatalities or the casualties it mimics the model do you understand this now there is a great example called the uh, the monarch butterfly and the viceroy butterfly the viceroy butterfly if you see it mocks the model and the viceroy butterfly is defenseless whereas the monarch butterfly has some defenses and this is an example this is the viceroy which is non poisonous and this is the monarch which is poisonous and it mimics it and behaves like it just to save itself clear but then there is also mullerian mimicry where both of them have the poison and one example would be this with respect to mullerian is a red postman and common postman the red postman has poison the common postman also has poison but yet they mimic just to avert the catastrophe okay now look at this this is adaptation to cold conditions as you in cold conditions you can understand the body fluids they may freeze so you develop some anti freeze proteins and these anti freeze proteins or help or freeze avoidance behaviors this help in not allowing the body fluids to freeze like what body fluids do you carrying say for example blood if the blood freezes there is instant death so these anti freeze proteins they are uh, or nucle nucleus or nuclei they are created in the cells which help not to freeze under freezing conditions that is adaptation to cold and see adaptation to water scarcity you understand that like so for example the camel it has adapted tremendously to water scarcity or warning coloration warning coloration see this is the dart frog which lives in the amazon forest it is very highly poisonous clear so it creates vibrant colors and so colors so bright it is and everybody knows about it all the other organisms know about the dart frog and whenever there is the dart frog sitting somewhere matlab duri bana kar rakhte hain wo they avoid it and you can say in that terms the dart frog is the real king of the amazon forests 
बिकॉज नो बडी डेयर टू क्रिसक्रॉस अब हाँ वही कर सकता है जो ऑर्गेनिज्म सोचे कि अब चलो सुसाइड कर ले बट ऑर्गेनिज्म नेवर थिंक लाइक दैट वेन एनिमल्स आर नॉट वीक एनी हाउ नहीं सी एक एक ऐसा चूहा है जिसका नाम कैंगारू रैट है नाउ दिस कैंगारू रैट कैन लिव थ्रू आउट इट्स लाइफ विदाउट ड्रिंकिंग वाटर दैट्स अ काइंड ऑफ एडेप्टेशन एंड दिस इज हाउ इट लुक्स लाइक दिस इज द कैंगारू रैट एंड इट कैन बिग इयर्स लार्ज आईज इट कैन लिव इट्स एंटायर लाइफ टाइम विदाउट ड्रिंकिंग वाटर क्लियर so the last thing that we will do today is the different ecological interactions and you already know about it first is your mutualism mutualism means both the organisms they benefit symbiosis is a special kind of mutualism where there is physical association and say for example the coral polyps and the zooxanthellae the zooxanthellae lives inside the tissues of the polyps so this is a physical association so we call it symbiotic mutualistic relationship like say for example the crow and a buffalo would have only mutualistic relationship but might not always have a symbiotic mutualistic relationship again uh, mutualism is of two types obligate and facultative obligate means if you remove one species the other one also vanishes like if you remove zooxanthellae the polyps also die but facultative means if you remove one species there is another option and you can form the symbiosis with or the mutualistic partnership with some other organism but do you remember this that uh, symbiosis is physical association so those organisms which have developed symbiotic mutualistic relationship find it hard to find another alternative and that's why they are more vulnerable for example the coral reefs okay do you understand commensalism in which one organism benefits whereas on the other no impact immensalism one affects gets affected negatively on the other there is no impact prey predator relationships prey and predation one benefits the other one and then you have parasitism where one benefits and the other does not but you see one thing parasites they are generally smaller than their kill the predators are larger than their kill parasites you see they kill their host in a long period of time but the predators kill them instantly parasites are more successful than predators predators generally fail in catching the prey also one more thing you keep in mind that parasitism promotes biodiversity if there is no parasitism then one organism will extract all the nutrients and will make the soil depleted but it is the parasite that lives on its body which acts as a check on its absorption of nutrients thus allowing more nutrients there in the soil at any given point of time and thereby enriching the biodiversity right one line parasitism promotes biodiversity parasitism promotes biodiversity clear and the last one is neutralism neutralism means there is no no effect in fact some ecologists feel that this is not a good category to include why because when we say neutralism it means no interaction or no effect and no effect is only possible when there is no interaction because maybe there is some impact and we are not aware of it so these are the important relationships and you understand all of them now so that is it for the day so do you have a good idea of the basics now good thank you